Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation. So, uh, and thank you for that brilliant panel. That was such a wonderful way to just lead into this next one. Uh, so welcome to the panel, Generic Absence and the Cultural Politics of Reappropriation. Today we have two different speakers. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Orquídea Morales. So I'm going to present you really quick. Uh, Dr. Orquídea Morales is an assistant professor of American Studies and Media and Communication Studies at the State of University of New York, Old Westbury. Morales received her PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan in 2018. Her work on border violence, Latinx media, and Chicana feminism has been published in journals such as Film Quarterly, Label Me Latina, oh, Latino, and the Yuda Foreign Language Review, as well as the anthology, The Rutledge Companion to Latina, Latino Media. She is currently working on her book manuscript tentatively titled Border Horror, Genre, and Death on the U.S.-Mexico Border, which I'm personally very much looking forward to reading. So I'll take it, take it away, Orquídea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valeria, for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to share screen. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, my presentation's title, La Llorona and the Absence of Latinx Slashers. Um, so in this presentation, I discuss the absence of Latinx slashers and really broadly thinking about the absence of, of Latinx communities within the horror genre. Um, this is an important question for multiple reasons, one of them being that Latinos um, or Latinx communities are one of the biggest audiences of horror films in the U.S. and really internationally, um, but they rarely are represented on screen beyond uh, a few roles uh, and mostly kind of um, as the villain or mostly as this like um, external locale. So it's mostly within the Latin American context when they are represented. Um, so I read the invisibility of um, Latinx in slashers as a clear indication of the U.S. desire to create and expand gentrified spaces. Um, so kind of thinking about this conversation that Miranda started about um, a white flight, right, and what that looks beyond the U.S. border. Um, Second, I introduced La Llorona, a, a monster usually seen as a ghost, as, as a possible Latinx slasher by analyzing the directed video film, The Whaler or La Llorona, which was released in 2006. In this film, the Latina body is sexualized and turned monstrous um, as La Llorona becomes a slasher, stabbing and massacring teens who invade her space. By centering the absence of race and then recentering our definition of slasher around a brown woman, La Llorona, I aim to begin a conversation about Latinos in horror. So um, who is La Llorona? I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with the story. La Llorona translates to the wailer or the weeping woman. Um, the image and myth of La Llorona has been continuously used in films uh, beginning in Mexico. The first horror film in Mexico was actually a Llorona film in 1933. Um, then into the U.S. and there's other countries that have created Yorona films, including the most recent 2019 award-winning movie uh, from Guatemala named La Yorona. Um, I found an, a movie from India from the 1960s that was also about La Yorona, which is a, a weird outlier. Um, this monster has terrified audiences for, for really centuries, uh, yet little, little has been written about her in relation to, to film and through a horror studies perspective. So the story of La Llorona or the Weeping Woman is one of a woman who's usually um, described as indigenous or mestiza in Mexico who falls in love with and has children, um, one to two ch children with a man that is either Spanish or um, and or upper upper class, right? So outside of her of her status, outside of her uh, racial boundaries. Um, so they have children out of wedlock, and then he decides to leave her for someone of his own socioeconomic racial status. And after this happens, she decides to drown her children um, as a form of revenge. So the the idea with this narrative is really about. Um, understanding the or creating boundaries around the role of women, um, definitely about, you know, no sex before marriage and things like that. Um, the legend, uh, after she kills her children, the legend goes that she, it, she um, haunts that body of water 
and she looks for children to replace her own. So she usually takes children and drowns them. That's the, the usual um, telling of the legend. Um, Different variations include La Llorona that drowns children as a form of revenge, right? As um, this lover that left her, so she's a jilted lover that kills the one thing um, that her partner wanted or loves. Um, there are other versions where she drowns her children accidentally, but is um, so overtaken by uh, remorse and sorrow that she kills herself. Um, in one version, the weeping woman is uh, poor, like I said, with a man who is typically the father of her children. Um, she drowns her children. A second freaking variation presents a woman dating a man who is not the father of her children. And after he threatens to leave her because he is not ready to be a father, La Llorona drowns her children in hopes that he will stay with her. Um, in other words, La Llorona kills her children to save the relationship. Um, all these versions play a role in teaching women and men proper gender roles. Variations of La Llorona and her prevalence along the US-Mexico border though, also remind us of the precarity of familial structures um, and the loss of children to ICE, cartels, and the environment. So um, beginning in the mid 60s, um, definitely in today, into today, a lot of Chicana feminists um, have um, recuperated uh, the image of La Llorona as an image of a woman that is um, crying out against injustices, that has a voice uh, when women of color traditionally don't. Um, so there's this sense of power behind the image of La Llorona, and she has been used in art and literature to, to represent that. Um, most recently, uh, in protests in Mexico City, for example, she has been used, um, and, and the song La Llorona has been used as a way for women of missing, um, family members or mothers of missing that who have missing children um, to kind of point out uh, the injustices of the political system. So her, her usage has changed quite a bit across time um, and space. So for some reason, it's still not going through. I'm just gonna keep going uh, without visual aids for now, which I haven't done in a while, but we'll make it work. Uh, so the movie I'm talking about today is the 2006 direct-to-video movie, The Whaler, La Llorona, uh, directed by Andres Navia. It has a very standard um, horror movie plot where six friends um, and college students, so they're Andrew, Mike, Jay, Michelle, Ashley, and Julie, they go to Mexico on vacation, and then um, on their first night there, they're sitting around eating tacos, um, as you do in Mexico, and um, they, they're they talking about not having a place to stay, there's no hotels available in this small town, um, and this guy comes up to them and offers them a cabin. They, of course, say yes, so they go to the middle of nowhere to this cabin and um, start partying, and that's where they uh, see La Llorona. Um, in this film, La Llorona is framed within the slasher genre, which is a traditional uh, American uh, horror subgenre uh, by using the cultural icon of La Llorona that many Latinx audiences would be familiar with. Within a typical um, American slasher film context, the film aims to maintain their core Latinx audience while at the same time appealing to non Latinx um, audiences by making a slasher film in English. So, um, the way this movie was uh, distributed uh, is really interesting. It's actually a trilogy, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, but it, it was available usually under the label of like Spanish films, like Spanish language films um, or uh, Latino film, even though the movie is in English, right? So it kind of tried to vacillate between these different audiences. Okay. So although um, the the distributor Laguna Productions classifies the movie as a supernatural movie, um, which it, it kind of is. Um, I, I also want us to think about it uh, again as a slasher uh, because of the archetypes and the way that the plot is built. Um, and one of the things that um, I want to think about as I keep working on this is its relationship of this movie to um, mockbusters and, and direct-to-video markets that, that play with uh, traditional uh, plots and tropes, right? And rarely change them. They just change the cast to make it look uh, multi-ethnic, right? To again, um, cater to different audiences um, that the mainstream uh, films don't cater to in the same way. 
Oh, yes. Thank you so much. So I'm on slide four. Uh, I guess, yeah. So this is the cover of the movie, The Whaler. Um, and on the right, you see the image of La Llorona. Um, so in, in this movie, she um, she is with a man who doesn't want her children. She, he's not the father. She drowns them. And then um, after he realizes what she's done, he stabs her um, and kills her. And she becomes La Llorona. So we kind of see um, the different faces of her. Um, So it's important to emphasize the slasher aspect uh, that La Llorona shares with um, slashers who are traditionally male, white in the US. Um, slashers, as the name implies, use sharp objects, including nails, blades, machetes, and knives, uh, and chainsaws to slab, stab and slash their victims. Um, Carol Clover explains why stabbing and slashing are important aspects of this uh, subgenre since, quote, all phallic symbols are not equal and a hands-on knifing answers a hands-on rape in a way that shooting, even a shooting preceded by a humiliation does not, end quote. So the act of stabbing mimics the penetration act and as such, it can be read as a visual representation of rape since it is violent and an unwelcome act. Um, these slashers penetrate their victims to establish their power. The fact that the most vicious stabbings in these films are to young women, right? There's a hyper-focus on violence against um, young women. Uh, further solidifies this interpretation of um, the phallus and penetration. In The Whaler, we have the traditional elements of the slashers. Um, the killer is a product of a bad fam family dynamic. Um, she was murdered by her husband after killing her children. Uh, she is a dissolution mother and lover. The location is not home since the travelers are in Mexico, so definitely a terrible place, right? Uh, quote unquote. Um, and the weapon is uh, her long nails. I'll add briefly here on the idea of the terrible place um, that Carol Clover talks about in relation to slashers. Uh, many slasher films take place in suburbia or adjacent places such as lakes, camps, and things like that. These spaces are usually represented as primarily white with a few disposable characters of color um, in the outskirts. Um, the movies produced in the late 70s and early 80s clearly clearly reflected the process of redlining and gentrification or white flight many cities were experiencing post-World War II. After World War II, with things like the GI Bill, white families were able to move out of cities and uh, create or recreate segregated spaces. Horror films in the 70s and 80s reflected the fear of the unknown known, right? What happens when we're just, we're in this safe suburban space, what does the other look like? Um, so movies like Stepford Wives, Last House on the Left, Poltergeist ad address these issues of what's buried under these safe spaces, what's, um, what's hidden uh, behind uh, normalcy. So the fear becomes uh, that people that look like your neighbors, that look like you no longer um, might not be safe, right? They might be the horror. Uh, so the, the horror was no longer in a faraway land, uh, but here at home, um, particularly white homes. Uh, this cultural milieu gave birth to the slasher where the killer could come from our very own family. Um, they, it could be our son, our neighbor, someone that works with our kids, right? Uh, left out of this equation were people of color, um, except for a few notable, the notable example of Candyman, um, which is a slasher, but uh, a very different urban context uh, to it. In the case of the film, The Whaler, La Llorona is not afforded the luxury of existing in suburbia. She is twice removed. She is situated outside of the country. So we're not even in the US anymore, right? We're in Mexico and she's situated in a rural space. They had to drive for like 40 minutes. It seemed like a really long drive to get to this particular uh, cabin. So there's nothing else around. Um, so it's definitely outside of the white picket fence dream. Thus her otherness and the terribleness of this terrible place uh, she inhabits are overdetermined to remind us how far removed she is from, um, from whiteness. Um, so even, even before she came, became La Llorona, she was already monstrous. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> 
so the other component of the slasher um, is the, the way they kill, the, the stabbing um, and slashing. The first murder in The Wailer establishes these tropes um, of the, the tropes of the slasher film clearly. So when the college students arrive to the cabin, they start partying, drinking, making out. Um, everything is fine until in the middle of the night, um, the lights go out. So they're playing strip poker um, and the lights go out and Mike and Andrew decide to break into one of the rooms that um, Juan, the local that drove them to the cabin, told them not to go into. Um, so they, there's one particular room they're not supposed to go into. And of course they break in. Uh, while they're doing that, um, Jay and um, Michelle go into a bedroom and they decide to have sex. Um, the first victim is here on the left is Jay. He's the token black character in the film. Um, up until this point, he's kind of served as comic relief. Um, he says things like, uh, VIP, that's how we roll dog, you know what I'm saying, and I get your drink on, right? So there's, a, against this hyper determination of their roles um, and, and the archetypes that we traditionally see in slasher movies. So Jay and Michelle are in the bedroom and after the lights go out and after deciding that quote, weed made me horny, um, they, they have sex and that's when La Llorona first attacks. So there's this double um, moment where they, as soon as they open the door, uh, Jay is killed by um, La Llorona. Uh, so when um, the others hear Michelle scream, Mike and Andrew break down the door to the room and see that Jake is on the floor covered in blood. So we have the slashes on his face uh, and on his back. Um, and when Michelle finally stops crying, she said that it, she says it, it was her, she came out of the wall. So the mysterious her is La Llorona, who after being awakened by the trespassers has emerged from the house itself to kill them. Next slide, please. Uh, so Michelle, after Jake's death, runs to the bathroom and hides. There the door jams and she screams for help so she can't get out. And slowly the Yorona comes out of the bathtub and attacks her. Um, the camera focuses on her monstrous dark face and her long fingernails uh, that threaten to penetrate Michelle. Her fingers are very phallic and also bring to mind the, tra the traditional uh, slasher tool. So they're very similar to Freddy Krueger uh, and Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, the, the sharp blades. Um, in the case of La Llorona in this scene, the nails could be read as a type of transgressive gender role though. Long, well manicured nails are usually associated with femininity. In the case of La Llorona, her long deformed black nails question those standards of beauty. So it's, it's a really interesting way to, to play with those standards of beauty and to make them something um, horrific. So the representation of La Llorona as slasher in the whaler plays with traditional gender roles and is in a way uh, uh, represents her as, as a form of cross-dressing into the role of the traditional male uh, slasher. However, La Llorona is objectified as sexual object in multiple scenes in the movie, which is highly unusual uh, for the slasher genre, right? We rarely, um, never do characters comment on Kruger's hungry looks or Voorhees' muscle in the franchises, Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, right? It's never, um, quite that. In this film, however, La Llorona looks, uh, La Llorona's looks, so how she looks, are pervasive visually since there are constant shots of her before she drowned her children. Uh, and male characters ogle pictures of a woman in white that they find in the cabin. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, for example, when Mike and Andrew find a picture of her, they comment on her physique by stating that she was a hot bitch. So the image that they find is actually the image here on the left of this woman in a white dress drowning two children. So some somehow this picture of the murder is in the cabin um, and they don't notice the children. They just focus on her being hot and the fact that she's wearing white and, and there's water involved, right? So there's all these connotations with that. Uh, so before turning into the slasher, La Llorona is figured as a desirable object and the film constantly reminds the viewer of the fact um, through the constant focus on this particular picture of her. The, this, position of La, this positioning of La Llorona questions how we see slasher films and how we see the slasher her himself. Um, Clover claims that the slasher who is typically male is constructed as feminine because of uh, because either his sexuality or virility is questioned. 
She explains that, quote, to the extent that the monster is constructed as feminine, the horror film thus expresses female desire only to show how monstrous it is. In the film, La Llorona's femininity and sexual availability are highlighted particularly by her objectification of the male gaze. This discourse is directed, though, to La Llorona's body before her transformation into the monster. As the slasher, La Llorona is covered in this like black tar. Um, her face is no longer clean and beautiful, uh, but black with piercing yellow eyes. Um, the only remaining familiar characteristic of her femininity are her now her monstrous nails and her dark curly hair, perhaps a reference to her mestiza identity. So this is one of the things that um, is enhanced after she turns into a monster, her hair gets bigger um, and, and um, curlier. Next slide, please. So the film presents a foil to La Llorona's character. The heroine of this story is Julie. Um, here we see her throughout the movie. Um, she is our final girl. So she is the virgin of the group uh, because even though she does have a boyfriend, she restrains herself from um, being overly sexual. Um, she kisses Andrew, but compared to the other female characters, Ashley and Michelle, Julie is the good girl. Um, she's the one that's, you know, studies in school, that sort of stuff. Um, she is good because she worries about her grades, her family, and has a boyfriend who is also good and caring. Um, so they are the couple that makes it to the end of the movie. She is also the most white presenting in the movie. The other two women are ambiguously, ambigu ambiguously racialized as Latinas or mixed race. Um, Clover explains that the relationship between the final girl and the slasher is complex since they have, quote, a shared masculinity materialized in all those phallic symbols and is also a shared femininity uh, materialized in what comes next, the castration, literal or symbolic of the killer at her hands. The final girl in Clover's work is the heroine who makes it to the end of the film only, only to come face to face with the monster. In the end, it is up to her and sometimes uh, an, another person to kill this monster. Um, the final girl's castration of the monster is necessary in order for the acceptable gender norms to prevail since in castrating the monster, she is also placing herself in the masculine source of power. So at the end of the movie, we kind of have this um, reinstatement of the status quo. Um, the final girl, Julie, in The Wailer pr problematizes these rules of horror because her confrontation with the slasher, La Llorona, does not turn out as expected. Um, as the final showdown with La Llorona, Julie wakes up on the porch with the light of the day, of day hitting her face. Um, so she's she wakes up, she's crying over Andrew, her boyfriend, who's dead, and she seems to be the only survivor. Um, then we at this point, we still don't see her face. We only see the back. And we see she's covered in blood and she's walking towards Juan who's there to pick them up. And Juan starts shooting at her and runs away. Um, when we finally, she looks in the in the side mirror of the car and we and sees her face. Um, so she, the audience discovers along with her. So now we're seeing things through, through her eyes, right? We discover it when she does um, the truth. So she is no longer Julie, but is this um, mixed, um, body, half her face belongs to La Llorona. So the possessed half of her face has that black like tar that we had seen earlier. Um, and she she has this final scream when she realizes who ha she has become. So she survived the night, but only because La Llorona wanted um, uh, this vessel, right? So in the case of the whaler, the victim does not def defeat the other, but is merged with it. Um, so she becomes this monstrous Yorona. Uh, Julie is consumed physically and then psychologically by La Yorona. This ending allows a questioning of gender norms. Uh, since La Yorona, the feminine was not defeated, but instead was able to incorporate herself um, in the stereotypical Julie. So in this slasher, the final girl does not defeat the monster that is di disturbing the balance between bad and good, but is rather merged with this monster. This merging, cre this merging created a new Yorona that incorporates different identi identities. So we have La Yorona from the past and now Julie forming uh, one new monster. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in the, the whaler La Llorona uh, is portrayed as a monstrous other who should be feared and that kills those that have trespassed onto her territory. The end ending is particularly important since Julie or the final girl does not 
win in her attempt to metaphorically castrate the slasher Yorona. On the contrary, it is the feminine Yorona that succeeds in creating a new entity through Julie. Um, by leaving the ending as a cliffhanger, the filmmakers have left a space um, open to further question gender and the portrayal of La Llorona um, and Latinos in, in horror. So it, it is now a trilogy uh, and we see the development. In the second movie, it's more of an exorcist movie where um, Julie's father goes to Mexico to look for her and then try to exorcise La Llorona out of her. So it, 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 um, the, the series uh, switches from horror subgenres throughout. So thank you very much. All right, so Orquidea, thank you so much for that very fascinating paper. I know I made a lot of notes about this. Um, so now we're going to hand over, uh, and I'm really glad to uh, introduce Morten Fettfos Thompson, uh, doctor from, senior lecturer from the department. Yeah, he is a senior lecturer with the Department of Comparative Literature at Karlstad University in Sweden. Uh, his primary field of interest is the interaction of literature with other media, and his doctoral dissertation traces the manifestation of various intermedial strategies in novels by Don DeLillo and Klaus Beck Nielsen. He has recently published an article in Horror Studies investigating monstrous intermediality in the Babadook, and is currently working on research projects concerning Scandinavian slasher cinema and serial killer narratives. He is also a member of the research group for culture studies at Karlstad University. So take it away, Morta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can uh, share my, my screen. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone can see the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so my uh, paper today is titled Class Community and Carnage, the Swedish Teen Slasher. Um, despite its prominence in horror cinema, uh, the teen slasher's impact in Sweden has been uh, relatively limited. Uh, since the release of 1983's The Bleeder, in fact, uh, as far as I know, uh, only three other films have followed, Camp Slaughter and Drowning Ghost in 2004 and Death Academy in 2005. Uh, but um, rather than speculate upon the uh, possible explanations for uh, this uh, seeming lack of interest, uh, what I want to do here today is to explore a selection of the few examples that do exist. Um, my main argument is that uh, Swedish uh, filmmakers have employed the uh, conventions of the teen slasher in order to engage with issues uh, relating to the concept of, of the a welfare state and the ideals of social justice and economical and political equality associated with it. Uh, my focus will be on the bleeder and drowning ghost. But um, all of the films mentioned uh, explore a collapse or a kind of um, disruption of the welfare state ideal uh, while, while also offering um, different interpretations of and paths. Uh, possible paths beyond this uh, this crisis. Um, the Bleeder uh, centers on a, a female rock band whose tour bus breaks down in the middle of nowhere. And uh, searching for help in the surrounding woods, the band stumbles upon a seemingly abandoned village whose only inhabitant is a sort of um, a childlike man who suffers from a, a severe case of hemophilia, uh, begins stalking and killing them. It's a very basic, basic plot. Uh, from the outset, the theme of class is, is present as the, the film's prologue tells the, the tragic backstory of a, a working class woman uh, raped many years earlier uh, by a member of the landowning elite, uh, resulting in, in, in the birth of a, a sickly boy who was subsequently left to fend for himself after his mother committed suicide. Uh, it is implied, of course, that this boy grew up to become the film's titular uh, killer. Uh, and uh, the violent events portrayed in the film are thereby uh, framed not necessarily as the result of um, individual uh, pathology or abstract notions of evil, uh, 
but as the result of social and historical circumstance, uh, in this case, uh, the, the violent transgression of one class uh, against another. Within this context, the female band members work as symbolic representatives of 1980s teenage, uh, teenage Sweden, which is of course also uh, part of the film's implicit audience. Uh, the portrayal of this generation uh, is far from valorizing. Uh, the protagonists um, spend the majority of their time uh, talking about boys and gossiping about, uh, talking about you know, celebrity, uh, celebrity culture and other topics of, of popular culture and are uh, seemingly more preoccupied with, with that type of, um, uh, with, with, that, with, with such matters than with uh, dealing with uh, the situation at hand. They frequently argue amongst themselves and complain about being bored and hungry, even as, as people around them are disappearing. Uh, so in every regard, they are portrayed not as individuals on the verge of adulthood, but as uh, petulant children, uh, not entirely without blame in their own uh, grisly demise. Uh, the bleeder in this way does not really feature a typical final girl, but instead valorizes male state-sanctioned authority in the figure of a forest ranger who ultimately saves the uh, the only surviving protagonist and defeats and defeats at least seemingly so uh, the killer uh, only those who ultimately uh, disregard childish preoccupations and lean on the proper male authorities for help that's what the film seems to suggest uh, will be able to survive and uh, the film's image of 1980s teenage Sweden uh, is uh, that of a generation so caught up in inconsequential consumption uh, that they are uh, entirely unaware of the dangerous uh, circumstances in which they find themselves. Uh, the film suggests a complete lack of community and caring among the teenage protagonists who instead come across as um, sort of almost malignantly narcissistic. Uh, Morton, um, uh, so sorry to interrupt, can you hear me? Yes. Um, unfortunately, your uh, slideshow is not in uh, presentation mode. Um, sorry, would you be able to close it and reopen it? Uh, my apologies for this. Okay, th there we go. It's It's gone to the right slide. Um, does this, does it, this work? Uh, yeah, it, it's on, uh, it's on the correct slide now, but uh, it's not in presentation mode. Okay. See if um, that works. No, it's uh, it's still on the full. It's gone now. <laughs> um, uh, Maybe this will work. Let's try this. There we go. Yes, that's it. Sorry to interrupt, but I uh, wanted to make no, sure. No, we thanks. thanks for helping out. <laughs> no problem. Um, Okay, um, let me just find my, where I left off. Um, yes, okay, slide seven, which uh, you should be seeing now, hopefully. Um, so this, this, this uh, portrayal of the, of the teenage protagonists also establishes a link between the protagonists um, and the killer. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, the killer comes across as distinctly childlike and many of his actions and mannerisms suggest that his mental state is that at least to some degree that of a, uh, a toddler um, and this portrayal of the killer establishing is, establishes uh, a kind of mirroring effect where the childish behavior of the teenage protagonists is mirrored in, in, in his behavior to some extent just as the killer's uh, mental infantilism if you follow the logic of the film is his is coded as dangerous, so too is the uh, infantilism of the, of the teenage protagonists. Uh, because of this, it ultimately takes the male adult authority figure to save the day. Um, in stylistic terms, uh, objective third-person perspective dominates, uh, and point-of-view shots are used only sparingly, which is um, illustrative of the film's uh, resistance to placing the viewer in situations too uncomfortable. There are almost no explicit on-screen depictions of violence, 
uh, rather a majority of the attacks end with the killer dragging his victims off screen with physical violence um, suggested by a sound. Uh, the only instances of on screen violence feature the killer sort of uh, grabbing his victims and and uh, choking them until they are unconscious. However, all of these scenes are presented in a manner so unrealistic that they come across almost comical. Uh, curiously for a slasher, furthermore, there are no instances of the killer using knives or the slashing or stabbing weapons. Uh, in one telling instance, in fact, the killer does pick up a knife only to throw it away uh, shortly before grabbing his victim. Uh, ultimately, therefore, the uh, the film is, the bleeder comes across as um, uh, reactionary in, in the way that it condemns its teenage protagonists as ignorant narcissists while valorizing male authority and rejecting uh, many, if not all, of the uh, stylistic strategies of the sort of the classical teen slasher formula. Uh, and while its backstory does gesture towards themes concerning uh, class struggle and social and economic equality and other themes as well but uh, it, it does so in order to position the teenage protagonists as entirely incapable of addressing uh, such issues as in, in any meaningful fashion so if there is anything to fight for in social and political terms within the framework of the film uh, clearly <laughs> teenagers cannot be trusted to accomplish much um, Similar thematic threads are evident in Drum and Ghost, with, which features a, uh, it's a, it's a sort of a whodunit plot, which, and it features a, a masked murderer stalking and killing the students of a boarding school. Um, in previous times, uh, the school was the, the province of the rich and powerful. Social reform, however, has made the student body more economically diverse, and much of the film, of the film's narrative centers on conflicts between students belonging to the old economic elite and the, the newcomers belonging to the middle and working classes. The film's main teenage protagonist, uh, Sarah, um, is in the process of writing an essay about past tragedies at the school. And much of the film focuses on her gradual uncovering of a series of violent abuses of power by school officials, as well as local authorities. Abuse is most often motivated by the need to protect those in power from being held accountable for their transgressions against the less privileged and powerful. Uh, the viewer is strongly led to assume that these past tragedies are in some way connected to the present killings. Uh, this turns out to be a red herring, however, um, and the killer is, is ultimately uh, revealed to be the brother of a girl who committed suicide uh, the previous year. and. Uh, the murders are cast as revenge against those students whose bullying, he believes, led to her death. Um, so, um, but while unrelated in narrative terms, strictly speaking, uh, the past violations uncovered by Sarah and the killer's quest for revenge work in tandem to foreground the interconnected themes of of class conflict and uh, corrupt institutional authority. Um, a link between past and present is thereby established, uh, suggesting that uh, past hierarchies of power and privilege persist, and uh, that the ideals of justice and equality, uh, so central to the, the Swedish concept of, of the welfare state, remain unrealized. As was the case with uh, the bleeder, the killer and drowning ghost similarly figures less as the result of individual pathology and more as a kind of symptom of economic, social, and political inequality. Um, in this context, the figure of Sarah becomes a, um, a symbol for the uh, possibility of change and progress through the uncovering uh, of social injustices. And she becomes a a cipher for a kind of youth rebellion against corrupt adult institutional authority. Um, unlike the bleeder, therefore, uh, Drowning Ghost seems intent on offering a sense of empowerment and positivity to its ostensibly teenage audience. And, and in direct contrast uh, to, the, to the bleeder, it casts the generation of early 2000s uh, Swedish teens as the catalysts of social change and progress.
Uh, like the Bleeder, Drowning Ghost resists many of the traditional stylistic features associated with the teen slasher. Subjective point of view, for instance, is used extremely sparingly. And in relation to depictions of violence, uh, specifically, killer point of view is not employed at all. Uh, there is actually only a single case of uh, a so-called killer point of view in the film, and it uh, is used in an entirely non-violent uh, context. Um, in other instances, the camera work suggests through movement and placement a perspective which might reasonably be associated with the perspective of an intradigetic character, uh, only to reveal that it is in fact an objective third-person perspective not aligned with any single character. On uh, several occasions, for instance, a perspective which at first seems to belong to, the, to that of the killer turns out to be a third-person perspective. Um, in this way, the camera work um, suggests alignment, but always rejects it. Uh, in fact, you could say that it sort of stages a form of rejection, uh, thereby you know, you know, avoiding aligning the viewer with the perspective of the killer. But in fact, instead aligning it briefly with the with with the victim. Um, so here is a shot where you can see uh, there's a shot which initially seems to belong to the killer, but then the killer walks into frame. This is just one example. Um, so although it gestures towards placing the viewer in a position which might allow uh, the viewer to partake in the killer's revenge, however, it it, it avoids doing so. Um, and instead, um, in those moments when, re when revenge is realized through violence, uh, the perspective shifts to that of the victim, suggesting that revenge, no matter how seemingly justified, is always morally suspect. Uh, while the film thus valorizes Sarah's quest for justice and her battle against corrupt adult authority, it rejects the killer's quest for revenge. This rejection uh, is, is established not only in narrative terms, but also in stylistic terms uh, through this uh, rejection of alignment with the killer's perspective. We are um, invited through the narrative to um, understand and uh, to some degree sympathize with uh, the killer's motives, but we are not made to adopt his point of view in, regard, in regards to the means through which he seeks to um, uh, redress injustice. Uh, as such, the film resists this, you know, the uh, the other um, resists ideological alignment. I would say with the killer's revenge motive, uh, but remains loyal to the perspective of Sarah and her non-violent quest for justice. So there you have it. This is um, something approaching a kind of victim POV in that scene. Um, unlike the Bleeder, Drown and Ghost emphasizes community, moral integrity, and fighting for justice as something of which contemporary Swedish teenagers are capable. Uh, unlike the Bleeder's, um, um, damning portrayal of its teenage protagonists, Drown and Ghost presents its final girl, as well as several other characters, as representatives of a generation of teenagers capable of resisting old hierarchies of injustice and inequality and fighting for justice and community in the face of a corrupt economic adult elite. It is a film which ultimately, uh, which is also sort of uh, suggested in the final scenes of the film, it sort of celebrates its teenage audience and its potential, potential for creating a social and political change. Um, so although the Bleeder and Drowning Ghost um, share similar thematic concerns and stylistic traits. They differ markedly in their response to, to the problems of social, political, and economic inequality. In The Bleeder, as, as mentioned, teenagers are viewed as childish, ignorant narcissists, incapable of creating any form of social and political change, and instead dependent upon institutional male authority. Drowning Ghost instead positions its teenage audience as capable of fighting the powers the be and thereby leading the charge for a more equal and just society. Indeed, you could say that uh, Drowning Ghost uh, criticizes precisely what the Bleeder glorifies, namely a kind of patriarchal capitalism. Um, in, any, in any case, 
uh, both films are, um, I think, interesting examples of how uh, the the narrative and stylistic framework of of the teen slasher has been used by by Swedish filmmakers to uh, to engage with issues uh, relating specifically to to Sweden's uh, social and political life, both uh, past and present. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Perfect. Thank you so much for both papers. Both have been incredibly interesting and illuminating. I was just monitoring the chat for some, but I will just go ahead and, and uh, ask some questions. That's all right. Um, and first, before I had I had it kind of pinned in, in the back of my head while you were talking, Morton, about these uh, different instances uh, of representing youth in a certain way and this sort of turn that happens right from one film to the other. Um, and I was wondering, and I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a, um, let's say of something that was in the background. I was thinking about the this proclivity of, of being restrained and, and portraying teenagers in, in a fashion that is much more akin to the US slasher in The Bleeder. So I was wondering how much of it, and I mean, I don't know if it's if it had anything to do with it, could be restrained with this desire of not being, um, censored or cut because it it seems to me that it was around the time where there was this huge controversy in Sweden about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all these shows were being uh, um, yeah like exploited on TV about how bad of an influence it was on the youth. Could you comment on that please? Well yeah you're absolutely right I mean in that period in the 1980s there was the uh, the so-called video violence debate in Sweden in which it was kind of media uh, sort of an extension of the video nasties debate in, in Great Britain um, so, um, um, that might have uh, been a factor, uh, absolutely, uh, in, in, in terms of this kind of restraint in, in, in relation to uh, graphic depictions of violence. Uh, there, are, there are other possible explanations as well, I think, historically. Um, you know, the, the, in, in the Scandinavian countries, there is a, a pretty strong tradition of censorship in relation to depictions of, graphic, of graphic violence. Um, and it's also, I think, culturally considered um, mm, not quite proper cinema, so to speak. So there are a variety of, 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 of factors. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, The, the Bleeder was not, uh, not a theat theatrical release. It was made for VHS market. Uh, I have yet to look into, into the matter in any, any great detail, uh, but that would lead me to believe that there was at least no official um, um, censorship involved. Um, I don't think that the VHS market at that point was particularly regulated, at least in Sweden. I may be wrong, but uh, that's, that's, I'm developing uh, these analyses at present, and I will, I will be looking in, in more detail to sort of the uh, that type of, of context. Um, in regards to uh, Drown and Ghost, um, it's interesting, Drown and Ghost was actually released theatrically. It was made by a director, which uh, Mika Hafström, uh, who uh, had the script lying around for a long time and couldn't get it done, couldn't get it made. Only after the success of his film, Unscan, I think it's probably translated into Evil, uh, which was uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Foreign Feature. That was kind of a big deal, uh, so he became a big deal in Sweden, and then he, he got to make his slasher film. Uh, but even so, um, it's a, it's it's a very stylish slasher. It has sort of, it, it, in certain ways, it's kind of reminiscent of, of Giallo in certain sense. Um, but uh, also there again, I think the the restraint in, in the depiction of violence. Um, um, there there are many possible explanations. But uh, it's it's uh, it's it's interesting that they share this this feature. The other examples, uh, it's it's quite different. Um, but uh, maybe we can talk about that some other time. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I mean, I look forward to also you know reading a little bit more about how this idiosyncrasy that has to do with the restraint, the proper restraint of the Swede, <laughs> to not be <laughs> conveyed in excess. And uh, and I mean, I think it's also yeah being a social cultural situation there. Um, but thank you so much for, for illuminating that. We have a question for Orchidea. Uh, 
Uh, and Bruna asks, uh, what do you think about the 2019 film La Llorona? And does the film bring anything to your research? So I'm unsure if it's the one that came with The Conjuring or La Llorona by Jario Bustamante. So I, yeah, that's, I what I was gonna, that, that's what I was going to ask too. Um, so what's really fascinating is the one with The Conjuring is very much that desire. And it was very clear from the very beginning. It kind of felt like um, paranormal activity, the marked ones. This is the Latino yeah. version, right? Version. This is for Latinos, uh, about Latinos with a white woman in the lead sort of situation. Um, but it was def it was definitely uh, created and marketed to, to that audience um, with an understanding that this audience is is really supporting the the Conjuring uh, franchise and, and a lot of horror films. Um, so I was not a, a fan at all of the 2019 US version uh, that Michael Chavez directed. It's it's an interesting movie and I it had a lot of possibilities because they brought in a curandero who's like a, a healer um, and they used him as a way to understand uh, the history of La Llorona and they provided different folk remedies. So they, they had the eye, like the evil eye and things like that. Uh, but it, it wasn't fully developed, right? It, it, it all felt very forced. Um, the Jairo Bustamante one from Guatemala, that's a completely different story. Uh, that movie is very much about kind of what a lot of like, um, particularly women have been doing with the image of La Llorona, using La Llorona as a way to make political commentary. And he talked about using La Llorona and horror genre specifically um, as a way to talk about the violence and the dictatorship in Guatemala and, and all the missing indigenous peoples and murdered indigenous peoples uh, through horror because it was a genre that wasn't policed in the same ways as dramas, right? So it's a way to talk about these topics without getting censored, without, you know, being disappeared um, like other people have been. Uh, but it's also a genre that people um, go to. So he he's like, I did some research. A lot of Guatemalans go see horror movies or superhero movies. I wasn't gonna make a superhero movie. So I made a horror movie using the image of La Llorona to talk about these disappearances and these um, this genocide of indigenous communities in Guatemala. Um, and even then the, the movie, uh, he's talked about how they had to film in uh, various embassies, like the French embassy in, in Guatemala because they were worried for their safety. Um, so, so yeah, those are, I highly recommend the, the Llorona by Jairo Bustamante. The other one is an interesting piece and really helpful in thinking about um, how Latinos are targeted or, or marketed to in the US, but it's not a good horror movie. So that's kind of how I see both of them. <laughs> and then, and that brings me a great deal to, to what you discussed in your paper, that I think we also sort of keep coming back to this really valuable pointer about the underrepresentation of uh, of Latinos in their specificity. Also this try, so I would, I would like to maybe frame my question or dig a little bit into your thoughts about this, this idea of Latinidad, this, this undifferentiated uh, notion where you have, I mean, for me personally, that was one of the pitfalls of La Llorona from uh, The Conjuring because it was this undifferentiated idea of Mexicanness as this overall narrative about what Latinidad is. Um, yeah. So where, yeah, where do you stand on this? So what we see happen, the, the first Llorona movie and the first horror movie in Mexico that came out in 1933 was all about um, indigeneity and Mexico grappling with its national identity and its history of conquest and its history of, uh, you know, displacing indigenous peoples and then identifying as mestizo, right? We're all equal because we're all mixed race, we're all mestizos, so there's no racism in Mexico. Um, and the, the, this horror movie is a, it was used as a, as a way to kind of think through those things um, and it was fairly early on in golden um, the golden age of Mexican cinema so it, it kind of sets those standards that we see in other productions of La Llorona in Mexico but then when we move to the U.S. the national context is so different because the La Llorona is not a symbol of Mexican national identity she's a symbol of Latinidad period right and mm -hmm. it's it that means it's a representation of Latin American and Latinos in the US, which which there's a distinction. But in this monstrous figure, 
it, it just, it's a conglomerate of all these other, right? Everything that we fear, that's not quite part of the US national identity that's never going to uh, integrate, um, that's always going to be outside of the boundaries of normalcy. And it is through the monstrous figure of La Llorona that we see this. So it, it, it's still about national identity. It's just, um, it's about protecting um, US um, whiteness, right? And keeping at bay, uh, Latin American and Latino identity. Um, but I think that that's the issue with representation, right? When we have one representation, we want it to mean so much. We want it to, to, to we want all want to identify with it and there's, that, that's impossible. Um, and we can think about how that happened within the Heights, but that's like a tangent, right? How a lot of people were rightfully um, mad that there weren't representations of Afro Latinos. And it's like, if there's just one movie, that's by Latinos with representation of Latinos, then that's the problem. It, it just the weight of representation is, is impossible. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think th those are just like, as a, as a closing note, I think a reflection that really draws so much from both papers. Thank you so much, this idea of, uh, how is that these contexts are represented in their specificity and what they can offer. So it brings so many other connections and unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you so much for your brilliant papers. And I really look forward to reading more about how they develop.